Hey, how's it going? This is Chad Haig, reporting from Southern India. I wanted to resume a series of videos, which I began about a year ago. It was last April that I started the social and political philosophy series of videos. And in fact, this will be the second video on Benito Mussolini and the philosophy of fascism. And I do apologize for taking about a year to resume that. But I did want to continue the discussion in that in the first video, which you can find on my channel, um, I talk about the historical context of fascism, and I will be revisiting some of that in this video, but I wanted to actually delve into the text of Mussolini's The Doctrine of Fascism, as well as some of Mussolini's speeches from the 20s and 30s, in order to um, expose the extent to which fascism is, I think, the single most abused word in contemporary discourse. Now, you know, especially with with the rise of Donald Trump in the United States. And it's very hard for a day to pass on social media without hearing this word thrown around. And yet it's the um, single word, I think, which we're not really allowed to interrogate as to what it actually means. And because of this grotesque ignorance about the actual meaning of this word, it's able to be abused equally well on the right and the left. So critique of Obama when he was in office was oftentimes met with uh, calling, calling him and Hillary Clinton fascists. Um, whereas with Donald Trump, obviously, uh, you know, I, I'd be hard pressed to think of a single far left activist who hasn't called him a fascist at some point. And yet nobody really understands what this word means. And in this video, I'm not going to be doing an analysis of whether the 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 value of fascism is good or bad. That's a whole nother discussion, okay? And this video, as a philosophy video, is going to be about what does this word actually mean? And might some of the people be surprised to find that the very same people who think that they're most against fascism actually agree with it more than they would possibly imagine. And that will be the content of this video on the philosophy of Mussolini. Now, as I mentioned, fascism is, sing uh, is the single most abused word in contemporary discourse. In fact, it's oftentimes used in outright contradictory ways. For example, in the first year of the Archdurd Report from 2006 to 2007, John Michael Greer reported getting a very bizarre email from a, a person concerned about peak oil, uh, warning him that the future after the industrial collapse was going to be a feudalist fascist future. And what that person didn't realize they were literally saying was that it would be a super decentralized because that's what feudalist actually means and a super centralized because that's what fascist actually means, future. The decentralization in feudalism, in which you have local fiefdoms, in which peasants work in loyalty to local lords, and uh, soldiers fight in loyalty to local lords, and the economy is supposed to be self-sustaining at a local level, is as far from the fascist tendency towards a strong state that centralizes activity in order to prevent abuse by uh, private business, which, by the way, is much closer to exactly what the same far-left people who claim to hate fascism, it's much closer to their belief than they realize. But anyway, talking about a feudalist fascist future is the type of nonsense people can get away with if they have no idea what these words actually mean. And of course, calling Trump a fascist and an authoritarian populist at the same time is another example of this type of nonsense because a fascist and an authoritarian populist are simply not the same thing. It's, it's another question whether either of those is good. But at a level of essence, those words are simply different definitions. And therefore, Fascist, if you look at the etymology of this word in Italian, in the late 19th century context in which it actually emerged, um, originally just meant 
group. So well, let me put it this way. Fasci, and it just meant group. So a fascist is literally just a groupist. And this was in the context of a peasant revolt against the established land-owning aristocracy that was trying to move Italy beyond the feudalist economic policies and political policies of the Middle Ages, which were hopelessly out of date with an industrializing uh, nation. Um, and of course, the fascists in this peasant revolt originally had nothing to do with the later legacy of fascism, which would lead somebody to think in retrospect in the 21st century that fascist always just meant somebody who was doing evil things because they were evil. Okay, if you ask the average person today, what does fascist actually mean? They'll probably just say, well, of course, that's just an evil person who does evil things because they're evil. And it's another question whether there were obvious abuses under Mussolini and the terrible things happened. But it's interesting that a regime that only had about 2000 political executions in its lifetime is has come to be. Uh, seen as the symbol of evil regimes itself, whereas there were 45 million deaths under Mao, and Mao certainly did not get the title at anywhere near the level of negative connotation as, uh, as a word like fascist. But of course, if we don't understand what this word actually means, and if we assume that it's always just been a moral movement characterized by evil, we'll be able to abuse it in precisely the kinds of ways that I've demonstrated thus far. I think one of the ironies about fascism is that many of the people who most enjoy abusing this word on the far left actually agree with much more of it than they themselves realize. For example, the concept of having a strong centralized state which regulates private business and corporations um, in order to prevent abuses that would happen if you didn't have sufficient regulation, and then imposes heavy taxes on the um, the industries and the wealthy in order to provide government-sponsored benefits to the masses in the form of, say, paid vacation days, or maybe if you're Bernie Sanders, you want free health care, free education. Um, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who is definitely the one of the last people who think they agree with fascism, actually agrees with far more of what I just mentioned than they realize. And that's the side of fascism, which I'm not saying is good or bad. It's a side of fascism's definition, which people don't have any idea exists because we haven't actually been able to study this. And this video will seek to tread into the forbidden territory of interrogating the essence of this word fascism. And I'm going to do that by actually examining the words of Mussolini himself. Now, I'm not interested in this video in reading a historical report about fascism written by somebody who's obviously going to be um, somewhat biased in reporting what happened in retrospect. And I'm not saying there's no value in that. I'm just saying that the purpose of this video is to actually look at Mussolini's words. The purpose of this video is to try to find what the essence of fascism is, not to determine the valence of whether it's good or bad or whether it's right or wrong. There are plenty of other videos on YouTube right now about that if you're interested. But of course, as a philosopher, I'm going to be more interested in the essence anyway, because one old joke goes that non-philosophers ask, or they think that philosophers ask, well, what is the meaning of life? If you ask somebody with no knowledge in philosophy, they probably think that that's all we do all day, is sit around and ask, you know, well, what is the meaning of life anyway? But the truth is philosophers actually are more interested in the question, what is the meaning of life within quotation marks? As in, when you use that word, what are you actually talking about? Okay, what does that word actually mean? And how can we even begin discussing um, anything with regard to the valence of it if we don't even know what it is? And I think Jordan Peterson's distinction in um, maps of meaning is going to be helpful, although this video will not be 100% in line with the way he distinguishes the two, in that for Peterson, valence is 
ambiguous because you're not so much fleshing out the specificity of something as an essence in which you're getting an exact determination of its definition. With valence, rather, you're working within a binary, and you might be misled to think that it's a continuum where on one side you have very good and the other side you have very bad. It, Peterson says psychologically, valences really are um, experienced as a binary. Something either is somewhere within the range of being good or it's definitively somewhere within the range of being bad. And those are the, the judgments that we make as natural beings who have to live a real life dealing with evaluating whether things are good or bad at the basis level with regard to our survival. And that's a perfectly legitimate way to dwell on the earth. However, that's not going to lead you to the essence. And the difference morphologically between an ambiguous sense that something is good or bad versus getting to the essence of it, which is precise and specific, is going to be the difference between making a judgment about whether fascism was good or bad or whatever, versus um, trying to go beyond the psychologically natural attitude by which we normally experience the word, the world, excuse me, in order to try to get at what the essence of that actually is. And this is a video that will deal with that, regardless of how you personally feel about it. So in order to talk about this, you have to understand things about politics in late 19th century Europe. And although it's a case today that we also have political parties um, market themselves directly in terms of the interests of a specific class, as John Michael Grimm mentions, um, despite lip service to um, the uh, radical emancipation of the globe poor, the Democrat Party actually is marketed in the interests of the class of people who gain a, their living from a salary. Whereas the Republican Party, or let's just say the Tea Party, the Trump Party, um, really does market itself by getting the allegiance of people who make their money from a wage. And we have this nonsense that uh, that's not the case in the sense that, you know, Rick Santorum was asked about the 99% and the 1%. And he said, well, yeah, I'm not interested in that. I'm, a, I'm the candidate of the 100%. And you have this lip service of, well, you know, it's not problematic to be behind the middle class because everybody's in the middle class is the myth in, the, uh, in America. Uh, but of course, um, that's not the truth of how politics is done today. And it certainly wasn't the case a um, uh, hundred years ago in Europe either. But at that time, they could openly acknowledge the fact that political parties were um, marketed in line with the interests of a specific class. And I think that the biggest challenge to talking about fascism today is the way that it was it would be productive neither to call it a liberal nor conservative movement, which of course is the only binary that most people are able to think within with regard to politics today. But if you look at the definition of conservative in late 19th and early 20th century Europe, you'll find that the conservative party at that time was actually in direct line with the interests of the old aristocracy. And that meant literally they were in line with the interests of landowners who still maintain something of a, you know, anachronistic feudalist um, political and economic arrangement. And they defended the interests of that established aristocracy by imposing tariffs to protect the Nash, the the industries within the national borders from foreign competition. And of course, the Liberal Party dis was distinguished from the Conservative Party in that the class they were in favor of the interests of was the bourgeoisie. And of course, rather than impose tariffs to pre to um, protect against competition, they um, uh, enabled free trade and more or less open borders with regard to the flow of capital. And that's what liberal really meant at that time. <clears throat> Excuse me. Outside of the aristocracy and the bourgeoisie, you had several parties actually competing for the loyalty of the working classes. And of course, the Socialist Party was one of them. And early Mussolini and the original fascist, by the way, um, were associated with you know this socialist working class movement. So the irony about a far left socialist um, condemning uh, fascism as the antithesis of that um, is that uh, the original fascists who were peasants revolting against landowners were socialists. But that's beside the point for the moment. Um, we could just focus right now on the fact that fascist movement largely broke from the logic of 
going after the loyalty of one particular class, but instead claiming to represent the nation rather than any one of them. Mussolini claimed that fascism concentrates, controls, harmonizes, and tempers the interests of all social classes, and it does that by establishing a strong state. And the strong state in fascism does things like regulate business in order to prevent abuses, <coughs> and uses what they consider to be fair taxes on business in order to provide benefits for the working classes like vacation days, or if you're Bernie Sanders, free college, or um, free healthcare, whatever. And the irony, of course, is that that's the last thing that your average far left socialist in the United States or Europe would think fascism was about. But of course, the purpose of this video is to clear up things like that. So we could examine Mussolini's actual writings to determine what fascism is, but I think that it's also important to determine what fascism is not. And Mussolini is fond of distinguishing fascism from other popular movements. And because those movements are so much more familiar to the average person who maybe does know something about materialism, but doesn't know much about fascism per se because of the coordinated effort to make that a forbidden essence that you're not even allowed to ask about. I'm gonna um, introduce fascism in that contrast first. So fascism above all is a counter ideology to Bolshevist Marxist materialism. Mussolini makes repeated cryptic references to spirit and he does not mean spirit as something like a secondary epiphenomenon, which is just caused by these material conditions in the sense that, you know, spirit is just an illusion or it's just ideological or it's something which really could be explained reductively by going down to material conditions. But for Mussolini, you have to treat spirit as something irreducible to material. And therefore, the nation is irreducible to the materialist concern of territory. He says, for us, the nation is mainly spirit and not only territory. And in fact, he says that you cannot understand human action simply through the lens of treating it as an ideological distortion of economic motives. And so he says some actions have no economic motivation at all. He says that some actions motivated by sanctity, he's talking about really religious um, motivated actions, um, don't have an economic motive. He also says that acts of heroism, he's probably talking about in acts of war, which he makes a big emphasis on in his writings, you know, it's to have an economic motive because, of course, if you're going to die or risk dying, you're not exactly going to be economically benefited from that afterwards. And he says that humans are not really puppets driven by economic factors. Subjectivity is not a passive reflection of material conditions, as Marx would argue, because, as I quote him, we're not motionless mummies with our faces turned towards the same horizon. We are living men who wish to give our contribution to the creation of history. The big question for Mussolini is whether you're really alive, whether you're really a man, for example, and if you're really engaged in creating history, or whether you're lifeless and passive with regard to the, the, the material conditions that are determining it for you. It's just that one thing that separates animals from humans is that animals can be made content pretty much just by achieving material well-being. You have um, horses that are well-fed and housed outside of the elements and given water and some exercise. Yeah, they'll be pretty, pretty well happy. Um, but humans, he argues, can never really reach perfect happiness just by maximizing the material comforts. And he argues that the very notion of materialism is an outdated ideology from the 19th century. He says that 19th century was the century of matter, but the 20th century is the century of spirit. And the Bolshevist repudiation of religion is also, for Mussolini, just an outdated idea. It's something from the 19th century. But in the 20th century, Mussolini says that uh, fascism is not necessarily the same thing as Roman Catholicism, but he certainly does acknowledge that fascism has a tie to Roman Catholicism as the religion of the Italian people, as he says, which you certainly do 
do not get from a Bolshevist attempt to, you know, get away from a religion. And there's many connections between pre-Vatican II Roman Catholicism and fascist ideology, which go largely unacknowledged because of a PR attempt on the part of, you know, the Vatican today to say, well, no, we were always against fascism and all that. And it's not anti-Catholic to say that there were very serious connections between those two movements such that if you understand traditionalist Roman Catholicism, um, as I do, I would argue from being raised in it, you'll understand a lot of things about fascism, as I'll mention in this video. So uh, approaches that focus only on economic results to get back to the discussion are an approach that you get with materialist Marxism, which um, Mussolini is not interested in because he said if you only focus on economic results, um, you are going to miss out on the chance to try to develop a state that is wide awake and has a will of its own. This is once again the distinction between passive material conditions and something that's really alive and conscious. And he says, contrary to how fascism is often portrayed, that it's not, it's not a race, which we're interested in. It's not a geographically divine, defined region. It's a people historically perpetuating itself. It's a multitude unified by an idea and imbued with the will to live, with the will to power. Mm, that's something that was unexpected, re reference to Nietzsche, with self-consciousness. Mm, that sounds a little bit like Hegel. And with a personality. And he says that materialism leads to inactivity that is death. And if you treat people as um, inactive matter, that's otherwise called death. But he talks about how, in contrast with that, power, which makes its will felt and respected beyond its own frontiers, which, of course, leads to the literal concept of imperialist warfare, which he argues, if you um, are bothered by that concept, that's really just a sign of weakness. Obviously, I'm not saying I agree with that, but that is Mussolini's idea. It says that the will of man, if you're really alive, cannot be checked by obstacles, since its self-expression demonstrates its infinity. Hmm, sounding a little bit like German idealism here. But ironically, fascists are not afraid of death, despite the fact that they're not materialists, in the sense that um, fascists know how to die much better than materialists in that he sees the refusal to engage with the real violence of going into battle to be something of a limitation which the fascist um, emphasis on really being alive allows you to overcome. So he talks often about how having to face war requires real courage, and cowardly clinging to material life is one of the outcomes of a materialist ideology. So another thing which fascism is not is it's not individualism, and he repeatedly critiques that as another outdated 19th century ideology. So Mussolini expressed grave skepticism about whether the critique against fascism, that it doesn't give sufficient um, sufficient freedom to the individual, is something which he argues is assuming that freedom is a type of reified absolute with only one meaning, such that it would have to be preserved first before any other fascist ideology is formulated. But he says, well, you know, the, the concept of freedom doesn't really have an absolute meaning because nothing actually is absolute in this idealist sense in life. He says, we've got freedom um, in the context of peace, and that's one thing. But you, then you have freedom in times of war, and that's another. And he argues that the context of war and peace will render the concept to not be one single thing that the state would have to take as an a priori condition of formulating its ideology. And he says that if you really want to talk about freedom, it's not a right, it's a duty. And the emphasis in fascism on having to, you know, selflessly do your duty is much closer to traditionalist and pre-Vatican II Roman Catholicism than even anybody within the Vatican today would acknowledge. And once again, that's not anti-Catholic. It's just an observation that I'll talk about more later. So in Roman Catholicism, for example, pre-Vatican pre II Catholicism, um, you have this notion that the individual can't decide the moral code of what's right and wrong, for example. 
because the individual or even the majority, that's another thing Mussolini is against, are not, they do not have an intrinsic ability to determine the objective truth of morality. That has to be left to a centralized and well-established magisterium in the Vatican. And the state in fascism in relation to the individual has much more in common with that than most people would realize. But anyway, he mentions that the state does not have to preserve the individual's freedom and certainly not its identity because the state necessarily transforms the people, even in their physical aspect. So the idea of having to take the identity of the individual as an a priori given that we respect is definitely not what Mussolini was interested in. And it's not even that the state will accommodate individuals. There is no such thing, he thinks, as an individual who exists before or outside the state. In fact, it's impossible to conceive, and as I quote, as I quote him, any individual existing outside the state unless he be a savage whose home is in solitude in the sandy desert. So fascism is not individualism also to the extent that the individual doesn't exist except as subjected to the state. But that means being subjected to the requirements of the state. And therefore, it's not that the state gives no freedom at all to the individual. He makes quite clear, at least according to him, that it's just that the state is uniquely suited to decide which freedoms are beneficial to the individual and which freedoms are either useless or harmful, in which case it's not really a freedom, it's a license. And this is an attitude quite similar to that of the Vatican with regard to the list of sins. Um, when I was a tr pretty traditionalist Roman Catholic uh, growing up in childhood, um, I often heard that freedom is something which, if it's real freedom, the Va it'll be in line with what the Vatican determines you, the individual can do. And if it's not one of those freedoms, then it's not really freedom. It's just license. So the freedom to go out and uh, do drugs or whatever, you know, that's not really freedom. That's license. And the attitude that um, the magisterium has regard with regard to ethics and duties must be regarded, re recognized as at the very least an implicit agreement with Mussolini's ideas about the relation between the state and the individual. And of course, he mentions that the individual is a very poor standard by which to measure the trajectory of a nation because the individual has a very short lifespan, which passes by relatively quickly, especially if many of them are dying in their 20s and fighting wars. But of course, the state embodies the conscience of the nation by preserving the language, customs, and the religion of a people. So this is also not the later deconstructivist critique of culture, the deconstructivist critique against um, you know, language of a nation, etc. He's interested in preserving those things, but not in some materialist reified sense that treats them as objects to be preserved in a sort of museum sense. Rather for him, the nation has this living conscience insofar as it has this tradition of language, customs, and religion. And of course, that became one of the things that is most critiqued about fascism. And I'm not making a judgment whether it's right or wrong. I'm simply saying that philosophically, that is something that makes fascism different from, say, you know, the Maoist cultural revolution. Okay. So individualism is also ethically inferior to the state because the individual wants to preserve a momentary pleasure, but that's the selfish self-interest, which is ethically inferior to the state which posits the difficult and self-sacrificing requirements of duty. It certainly was an old theme in Catholicism. I don't really know under Pope Francis how much that is the case anymore, but certainly at the time of Mussolini, that's the attitude in the Vatican. So to move on to the next thing, fascism is not democracy. Mussolini talks about democracy a lot, and in 19th century Italy, democracy was certainly a thing discussed, and the Vatican doesn't like maybe discussing that uh, democracy was something that they only accepted um, when it became impossible to not accept it. So in the 19th century, there certainly was a tendency towards viewing the uh, aristocracy and the nobility and the monarchy in the sense that the Pope um, was literally a monarch for much of uh, 
for much of history. Um, and democracy was not accepted in the uh, in in many sectors of Italy at that time. And Mussolini um, reflected that view by um, calling it uh, you know a an experiment. Okay, he thought that democracy was an experiment which had been given a chance in the 19th century, but uh, you know, we had run the experiment long enough to know that it was just an outdated ideology from the past. And Mussolini, as I talk about in my book with memeology, um, certainly does embody the fossil fuel deep meme of progress. Um, in the sense that he did think that fascism was quite simply that, it was progress. And you know, it's the 20th century versus the 19th century in the sense that this type of progress is also something he thought was spontaneous and inevitable and 20th century italy was moving along with a trend of progress beyond outgrown ideologies and he says history does not even travel backwards it's a misunderstanding to think that we could go back to retry things that have already been devalued by newer movements and he says that their problem with democracy is it's an ideology of number uh, it's an ideology of majority and it's an ideology of quantity but it's merely an illusory agreement that you get from working in the interests of a number of people that's quantitatively larger. Because he says that democracy fails to transcend the same conflicting interests of groups and individuals, which I guess the election already put on full display. And he says, according to him, that fascism alone can achieve that type of resolution of conflict. But it will do that by coordinating all of those groups to pursue higher aims to raise themselves up, mm, that sounds a little bit like German idealism, um, rather than cling to their own self-interested goals, which if they continued to cling to them would lead to more conflict. And, you know, regardless of whether democracy is better than fascism, that's not the, the, the idea here. If you look at the elections in the United States, something like that kind of does happen, doesn't it? After the conflicts of the 2016 presidential election were put on full display. Um, after the election, those conflicts remain. And it is there is something to the idea that clinging to self-interest will not go away, even if you get the majority, whether by the electoral college or by the population. So Mussolini also associated democracy with ethically inferior vices. He says that democracy is characterized by an easygoingness, a lack of personal sense of responsibility, uh, an exaltation of numbers, and of this mysterious divinity called the people. In other words, they, he has skepticism whether handing the power to the people, which is the literal meaning of democracy, really makes any sense because he calls this a mysterious divinity in the sense that he's not quite sure that that actually refers to what people think it does. Now, he's certainly in favor of the state as this concrete thing that maybe achieves at the level of a nation, what democracy only very ambiguously tries to achieve with the people. So Mussolini saw behind the power, excuse me, he saw the power of the individual in democracy as illusory anyway, because behind this facade of personal empowerment and behind this lip service to, oh, we're doing away with kings, you actually have a number of hidden kings and they're the ones making the big decisions. And the people think that it's their decisions, but it's really done by this group of people who, um, in the case of the United States, even the president has a merely parliamentary role with regard to. When um, Noam Chomsky uh, was interviewed about George Bush when he was still president, um, they asked him, uh, what would you ask him if you could uh, talk to Bush today? He said, um, not much, because Bush is basically just like the Queen of England. He just does a ceremonial um, function within Parliament, and the real decisions are made by other people anyway. And that is um, uncomfortably true about democracy. But anyway, democracy further assumes that the number denoting a majority is valid simply on the basis of an equality of the people in the sense that, you know, as deeply politically incorrect as this is, this is Mussolini's view that there really is no, in, there is no equality of people in the sense that, you know, if there's a hundred people, 51 of them would be enough to determine a valid majority on the basis of every one of their votes being equal. Because Mussolini says that there really is an irremediable inequality of men 
And they cannot be leveled by any such mechanical and extrinsic device as universal suffrage. In other words, you can legislate universal suffrage into existence, but that will not change the basic metaphysical fact that not all humans are equal. Because the Nietzschean view that Nietzsche himself didn't think he was better off than the rabble. He thought he was better than the rabble because if you change the metaphysical view to will to power versus, you know, material, um, you actually do have the sense that the will is not the same across the population. There are some who simply have a superiority with regard to the will to power than others. Not saying I agree with that, just saying that's what you have to understand philosophically about Mussolini to know what the hell you're actually talking about when you throw around these words. So finally, fascism is not utopia. I think of all of the things, this is actually the most interesting thing about Mussolini, is communism does promise utopia. Capitalism actually does promise utopia as well. Um, in communism, you have this idea that the utopia is going to come if we just you know, move far enough into the inevitable future of the worker's paradise, whatever. Um, and uh, capitalism is the utopia of, well, you know, if we just expand the middle class to include all 7 billion people on the earth, obviously they're not actually doing that. They just say they want to, then it'll be utopia. You know, um, you know, the, uh, you know, the, the, the kind of reduction of suffering and hard work and duty, which is characteristic of utopian movements on the left and the right today, is something that you do not find in fascism. Fascism, probably because it was, it was a movement that sprang out of the traditionalist Roman Catholic notion that you won't get heaven on this earth. In traditionalist Roman Catholicism, you work and suffer and do your duty in this life up until the moment you die, and then you do even more of that in purgatory, and then you finally get to heaven, and you really have to defer and work hard and sacrifice to get it. Um, that's kind of secularized in fascism into the idea that you don't get utopia from it. He said, we have rejected all theories of paradise. He tended to emphasize discipline, the courage to go out and fight rather than to selfishly try to preserve your material life, submission to duty regulated by the state, and a strong work ethic to actually build up this society, um, which have a lot more to do with traditionalist views of religion than with modern views of finding utopia here and now. And there's a deep dissatisfaction with um, even the amount of progress we've made because it's not good enough. You know, we've already got a standard of living for almost everybody who's not homeless in the West that is vastly above that of medieval kings, but it's still not good enough because we want utopia. And that is a modern attitude, which you do not find in fascism. The struggle, uh, excuse me, the vision of struggle and the strict requirements which the state imposes on the individual who piously does the duty should not be thought of as the achievement of some type of utopia or easy life. In fact, he says, life for the fascists is a continuous, ceaseless fight, and we accept it because we have great courage. Mussolini claimed that if the struggle ever did end, that would just result in a day of melancholia. It would not result in an, an easy life of leisure and happiness. So he opposes the charlatans, he claims, who place miraculous drugs on the market to give happiness to mankind. In the sense that, above all, he resisted shortcuts that would obviate the labor and discipline required to obtain things of lasting value. And in fact, when asked by a Finnish philosopher to describe fascism in one sentence, Mussolini wrote back in German, we are against the easy lift. So fascism in Nietzsche, uh, I can imagine a lot of people who came to this video would be very surprised to hear about this, but I'm not saying that they're the same thing. I'm just saying that there's references which betray at least, at, at the very least, a secondary familiarity with some of Nietzsche's ideas. Because he openly says, without the will to power, people vegetate. They live miserably, and they become prey to a stronger people, in whom the will to power is developed to a higher degree. And the idea in Dune that humans sort of relinquish their intrinsic will to power by handing over their thinking to um, their abilities and their thinking to machines in the hope that it would make them free actually just resulted in men who controlled those machines 
controlling them is a kind of very um, indirect paraphrase of the the, do, the 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 Dune quote. There we go, and that's kind of like what Mussolini is envisioning, even without the context of robots. He's saying if you do become a vegetating individual with no will, that's not going to set you free. It's just going to make you a slave to somebody with a higher will. And he says the Italy, which we feel to be so powerful, you know, with rising spirit of fascism so full of vital fluid is going to be grandiose it's not going to be modest and it's not going to you know relinquish its will it's going to be an embodiment of will to power and he harkens back to the roman imperialism as a model for what the roman people had achieved once and he thought that this was long dormant there was a roman spirit which was asleep for centuries but he says that it was reawakening in his ear and he says as i quote him the imperialistic spirit is the tendency of nations to expand, and that is a manifestation of their vitality, the sign that they're really alive. It says people who, are, who rise are imperialistic. Renunciation is a characteristic of the dying peoples. And he says, therefore, that a state does not supplement a nation already in existence. There is no nation unless you have a state, because without the state, you don't have a nation. You just have a human aggregation. You have a grouping of bodies, but you don't have state. So anyway, um, that will conclude this video. And uh, stay tuned in the next video on Anti-Tech Revolution by Ted Kaczynski. And I'll just mention that there's many more videos coming in the series on social political philosophy. We'll be examining the works of Lenin, okay, and uh, the works of John Locke and of Hobbes and Rousseau, and uh, of course, Plato's The Republic. So thank you for watching and stay tuned.